Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jane Stevens. I'm the training manager here at Zolo, and I thought I would change things up this week. As you know, if you um, are on the training channel in Workplace, you see that I post a calendar there with upcoming sessions. And today's session was supposed to be converting online leads, but I thought I'd switch it up because I did a working with buyers webinar the other day, and there were lots of questions about multiple offers. So I thought that it would be a good idea to maybe switch it up and do that topic for today because um, I'm hearing from a lot of you and I've experienced it firsthand as well uh, that uh, most properties are going into multiple offers and they're not even necessarily pricing properties low. I think, you know, there's that strategy and I think that's, you know, happened before where a listing agent uh, lists a property low um, in hopes of multiple offers, but right now it doesn't even seem to be necessary. <laughs> um, you know, they seem to be priced at fair market value and there's just low inventory, which of course causes there to be multiple interest. So uh, let's get started today talking about multiple offers. And I am going to talk to you guys about maybe a couple of strategies that you might want to implement in order to win in a multiple offer situation. Because yes, I know that we're seeing 30 offers, 40 offers. I heard from somebody on the last webinar that there were 71 offers on a property. So um, share with me your guys' experience, what you're seeing out there, what areas you're in. Um, the ones that I'm specifically referring to about the 39 offers, I think it was, that was a property in Barrie. Um, Toronto, I know, is, is different. So talk to me about what you're experiencing, what you're seeing out there. Uh, yeah, 70 in Mississauga, 25 in Caledon. Um, let me know if, if there's an agent here who works in Toronto, what, um, what's happening there, because I know that the condo market in Toronto is quite different. That's not um, an area I specialize in. So um, yeah, 25 in Georgetown, <laughs> 30 in Markham. Yeah, absolutely. There are so many um, multiple offer situations. And really, I know that that can be discouraging, not just for you, but certainly for your clients, but they has to win, right? And how do you do that? It's going to be a combination of really, you know, uh, connecting with the listing agent, uh, definitely, you know, building a rapport so that you're in the loop every at every stage and then you are going to want to have you know a strategy i'm going to talk to, about obviously having a firm offer in this market um but also we're, we're going to talk about the escalation clause that's something that uh, is a bit controversial but something that uh you know has worked for not just myself but other agents uh, we've we've had discussions about this before so hopefully um you know that's something that i can share with you a little bit later on so yeah uh, 10 to 20 offers in St. Catharines, 20 in Hamilton. Um, 
Let me see. I called for one house and it is not on the market and the listing agent said he got so many offers firm already. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we can definitely even talk about bully offers today. I'm not sure if I have a slide on that, but um, you know, when, um, yeah, if that's allowed, whether or not uh, you should encourage your clients to do that. I mean, if you are going to encourage your clients to submit a bully offer, if that is allowed, as I said, sometimes it's not, um, it really has to be a firm offer, right? Um, and, a, and a good offer. So you, you want them to consider it before, you know, it has to be so good that they're going to turn down the, the chance of uh, competing offers. So average 15 in Mississauga in Brampton crazy. Um, yes, that is one of the uh, one of the listing agents. I'm getting a comment here saying that it has to be firm, multiple offers so long as listing is below one million. Yeah, great point. Um, that is true. I think the uh, the listing that I'm certainly thinking of that had the 39 offers that was at a price point of 4.99. I think. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's that. True. I mean, I think the lower the price point, the more people think that they can, you know, get it for $4.99. So it results in a bunch of offers that just won't get accepted. But um, that's also the case with, you know, properties that are listed over a million dollars. We're, we're still seeing uh, multiple offers there, but you're right. Maybe not the, maybe not the 40 plus offers. <laughs> um, in Brampton, uh, started at 1.2 million, has nine offers. Yeah, so again, definitely seeing multiple offers in that price point as well, but just maybe not, you know, 30, 40, <laughs> 50 offers. So uh, what happens when you offer over 100 over and the bank approves 100 less? The seller has to pay out of pocket? Yes, so you definitely wanna make sure that you have clients who uh, will, will, you know, they have cash on hand, right? So maybe you've helped your, clients sell a couple of properties. So yes, maybe they will still need a mortgage, but you know, they'll be able to, to, to cover the difference. So uh, yeah, definitely that's, that's something to consider, something to, to let your clients know. Um, also, so, awesome. So keep chatting with me, you guys. Let me know if you have questions. We will get to some strategies, but I just wanted to talk all about really setting your clients expectations, right? So right when you're meeting with them, right when you're um, taking them out on showings, definitely have a discussion with them about what is happening in the market, what we're seeing, um, and letting them know that, you know, in some cases, Properties are going for, here's another thing that we can talk about, you know, $100,000 over ask. So it's not just, you know, $10,000 over, $20,000 over. Like some people are being really aggressive. There was a property that was listed, I think, for $749, which was in line with the comparables. And, um, you know, multiple offers came in in the 800s, right, which was probably to be expected, and it sold for 905. So um, yeah, we're just, we're seeing crazy things out there. So let me see, yeah, $223,000 over ask, 100%. Yeah, so we're definitely seeing that as well. So really, you need to sit down with your client, you need to know whether or not they're going to be willing to do what you're advising them to do. So are they able to submit a firm offer, right? That's going to be something right now that is, is going to be super key, and even being considered. So knowing, you know, whether or not they can go in firm, whether or not, you um, you know, they're going to be, their financing is confirmed, whether or not they're going to be comfortable submitting an offer on a property without an inspection. Now, listing agents, if you guys are listing a property right now, um, ideal, of course, to have a pre-listing inspection. Um, I've had buyers, I've heard of buyers who are doing their own inspections before offer dates. And uh, we had a home inspector uh, join us, I think, last month or the month before, uh, and he did, um, he was a home inspector and he talked about having a one hour sort of walkthrough inspection. So it's not as, as lengthy, it's also not as costly. So that's something that you may want to do with your clients. If they do want to take a look at a property, you can schedule uh, maybe a longer showing and have the home inspector come with you. So it costs less, but it's not as thorough, but they'll be able to kind of point out any, you know, crazy flaws. But again, as, I, as I'm saying here, if you're on the listing side of this, definitely have a pre-listing inspection, right? You're asking buyers to come in firm, give them the ability to do that, right? Give them the information that they're going to want to know. Uh, all right, I'm getting some more comments here. Let me see. Uh, everyone is doing everything sold firm. Yeah, exactly. So um, that is true. <laughs> there are still some times that you may want to, if, if the listing agent didn't have a pre-listing inspection report done, then maybe you have your clients, as I said, do that uh, 
pre-inspection, sort of that walkthrough inspection, which is less formal before submitting an offer. Or maybe you do submit the offer if you're really not sure if the condition, if the condition of the home isn't the best, then you know maybe you can go in with the condition, uh, a one day condition for the inspection. So in other words, you do put in that condition that you're gonna do the home inspection, but you're gonna do it within a day instead of what we typically put in, which is five days. And you know, maybe you can even along with your offer say, um, you know, we have a tentatively booked appointment for tomorrow. The home inspector is available tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, we'd like to do just a, a quick uh, home inspection and then we can remove that condition at the end. So, I mean, if you're, if you're up against 30 other offers, that's not gonna fly. But if you have two or three and the condition of the home is not the best, I mean, those, those properties are still out there, right? So you might wanna go in uh, and just be a little bit creative with the conditions that you are putting in. So that's an idea for you as well. Another thing I wanted to say, I had a conversation with a lead uh, just the other day who was very clear um, that they were not going to they were not going to get emotional emotional about buying a property. If they liked it, they were going to put in a fair market um, offer, but they weren't going to get emotional. They didn't want to be competing. They didn't want to you know have to be put in a position of offering more. So. A couple of things with a client like that. Now you know their what they're expecting, what their uh, limitations are going to be. I guess I should say. And so with somebody like that, maybe you say, you know what, right now is not going to be the right time for these types of properties. But you know, don't dismiss them so quickly. If they are still interested, there are still properties that aren't selling for whatever reason, right? Maybe it was just listed too high. Take a look. Be creative. Go into your MLS system. See what has maybe been terminated and relisted. And, um, you know, maybe approach those properties that aren't selling. Maybe they've been sitting on the market for a really long time. So, uh, you know, you might have an opportunity there to still secure a property for your clients who maybe don't want to uh, bid in multiples, right? So uh, take a look at maybe properties that have been sitting there on the market a little bit longer and show them those. But anything that's new hitting the market, most of the time it's, it's going to be sold probably within a week. So let them know that, <laughs> let them know what the expectations are, um, but understand their limitations and maybe get creative in showing them different properties. All right. Um, again, please chat with me, chime in and, uh, and let me know if, uh, if there are comments that uh, come to mind. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about preparing the offer because this is really uh, when you have to get down to, uh, to business with, uh, again, their expectations and, um, you know, it definitely, informing them that they do need to go in firm. So, you know, make sure that they have not just a pre-approval, but that they reach out to their mortgage broker and they get confirmation of that pre-approval. So if they're going to go in and they're going to prepare an offer, make sure that that mortgage broker is confirming their financing. And then of course, as well, you know, hopefully there's a pre-inspection report, but if not, you know, going ahead, maybe doing a walkthrough beforehand, or maybe even putting in that condition for one day, but really informing your clients that, um, you know, it's best to go in firm. Another thing also is to encourage your clients to get the deposit check. So uh, ask them to go to the bank, get the deposit check, typically 5% of the purchase price. Maybe it's more. Maybe you ask them to take 10% of the purchase price, whatever they have available to them. Uh, go to the bank, get a bank draft, and, um, you know, make sure that you're taking a photo of that or they're sending you a photo of that and you're attaching it to uh, your offer. So you're delivering the deposit herewith. So, you know, sometimes in multiple offer situations, if there are, you know, in the example that you shared with me, 71 offers, uh, you know, the listing agent might just set aside all of the offers that don't even have a deposit check and will only look at the offers that do have a deposit check, right? And uh, hopefully that's a stipulation that she has or he has said uh, beforehand and how they're going to review offers. You know, maybe that's a requirement and, you know, they're just not going to look at offers without that deposit. So uh, really prepare your client to present um, the deposit check. Um, so does the deposit go towards their down payment or before at or before closing. Yeah, so definitely that deposit is applied to their, their financing, their down payment. So it, it's not something that the seller keeps, of course. So yeah, it's, um, you know, it's encouraged to definitely show them the, the more deposit, the better, because if they're going in firm, even though it's firm, what happens if, you know, on closing something happens, right? They thought they were firm. They thought they, fi their financing uh, was going to come together, but maybe something happens and it doesn't close. And uh, so then the sellers have more of a deposit that they can, you know, um, 
whatever that would, you know, end up in a dispute and they would, you know, seek damages. So the more the deposit, the more security, I guess the seller has that. Yes, in fact, you know, the buyers are serious and uh, chances are that it will complete. So yeah. Does a pre-approval have to be in writing? Uh, a pre-approval is not a confirmation. Yeah. So a pre-approval is not a confirmation. Um, if you have it in writing, great. Um, you know, that might be something that you uh, attach to the offer, right? That they do have a pre-approval. Um, but most often than not, I think if you know that your client has just sold a property, for example, right? Uh, that's something that you might want to attach to the offer, the sold listing. So that the, again, the sellers in this particular case, they're reviewing multiple offers. They know that you have a client who you know, isn't just saying that they have uh, financing in place, but, you know, they've sold multiple properties maybe uh, so that they know, you know, they're going to be uh, more qualified or more serious. Um, okay, so yeah, let's talk about preparing the offer here. So definitely need a strategy. So definitely, again, talking to them about, uh, you know, having uh, a firm offer, but then also talking to them about this escalation clause, which we'll talk about um, in a second here, because what an escalation clause does, actually, let me see. Um, before I get to that, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty clear right now that, you know, any property that you're going to be putting an offer in on most of the time, unfortunately, is going to go um, into multiple offers. But sometimes, you know, if it's listed for that magical number of $9.99, know that properties in that area go for $1.3, you know that there's going to be multiple offers. So this is a strategy that the listing agent does uh, to price a property low in order to generate that kind of interest and hopefully have um, buyers... Uh, competing against each other and outbidding each other. But what also happens in this particular situation is that a lot of people are going to assume that this seller only wants, you know, $9.99 for this property instead of, you know, the, the actual market value of 1.3. So you might get a lot of offers in this case that are, you know, full price, right? <laughs> and uh, and that's just not going to fly. You'll, you'll see that in those situations, the property ends up not selling because the seller didn't get the 1.3 that they were hoping for. Um, so, you know, sometimes you know that it's going to go into multiples when it's priced low. Um, and then also you'll see in brokerage remarks that offers, if any, will be reviewed on a certain day and time. Uh, here, this is an old listing that I pulled up a while ago. We're not doing offer presentations really at any property right now. Everything is done online. So really important to reach out to the listing agent, kind of keep the listing agent involved right from the beginning. If you know your client is wanting to offer on this particular property, let them know uh, as soon as you know that you're going to be submitting an offer. Send the listing agent an email, maybe send, uh, maybe give them a call, ask for, you know, details in terms of, you know, what's the seller's preferred possession date, uh, when do they want to close, you know, anything else that you need to know about how to make your offer attractive, reach out to the listing agent and start creating that relationship with them. <laughs> you want to be the agent, the buyer's agent that's top of mind, that has a, uh, a line of communication with the listing agent. You don't just want to uh, be silent and then suddenly send in an offer when you're up against maybe even three or five offers. Uh, somebody else may have already been speaking to the listing agent, you know, trying to work together on a deal. So, you know, you just want to be building that rapport. You want to be the, the, the buyer's agent that is top of mind, right? Building that close relationship with the listing agent. Uh, so this is how you would know that they are accepting offers, um, you know, because they'll, they'll give you a date and time. So definitely letting your clients know as well. That that's what uh, the deadlines are and that they do have to be available during this time. So yes, offers may be ready or may be submitted at seven, but um, sorry, presented at seven, but they need to be registered by 5 p.m. So just let your clients know uh, the timelines and usually how long it might take for you to hear something back. So if they're presenting at seven, you know, there's oftentimes a little bit of a delay if they're still, you know, receiving offers, but, um, you know, it, it should be, you know, seven o'clock presentation. Hopefully you hear back something within the hour. Listing agents right now are also, I'm finding, very thorough in their offer emails. I don't know if you guys have experienced this as well, uh, but the listing agent will oftentimes, you know, if you showed the property and they are doing an offer presentation daytime, they'll send you an email with instructions, right? And they'll say, you know, this is the preferred closing date that uh, please deliver your deposit here with, you know, firm offers, you know, will be considered first. So, you know, they, they are being thorough in instructions. So just follow those. And of course, share that with your, um, with your clients. Let's see what comments I'm getting here about that. Um, if no comparable, should we use property tax to see if the price is fair? Um, no, property tax is usually very different. Um, 
there should be some sort of comparable, even if even if it's not you know exactly the same. And oftentimes they're not. Uh, you know, maybe it's a four bedroom and this one's a two bedroom, but the lot size is the same. Uh, you know, you can kind of adjust the price accordingly. So hopefully there's something that you can look at uh, that way. Um, I'm just admitting a few more people here. All right, so that's how you know that it's going to go to multiples, <laughs> although right now, as I said at the beginning of this session, even if they're pricing it for fair market value, it's probably going to go into a multiple offer situation and people are um, outbidding and in some cases bidding even more than, you know, what is in line with the comparables right now. So um, here, how do you know again? So again, uh, brokerage remarks uh, are pretty clear and on, on that. So just call other listing agent that just sold on that street or area. Oh, okay, yes, I see what you're saying here. So a, a suggestion to your comment, if there are no comparables, yeah, call another listing agent to find out what they sold for. So yeah, and that information should be listed on your MLS system as well. But you're right, if it hasn't been posted yet, then just, uh, yeah, you can reach out to a listing agent that maybe had an active listing previously. Okay, so in addition to the brokerage remarks that offers are to be presented on a certain day and time, uh, here you can see that in this particular case, the seller re reserves the right to entertain a preemptive offer, which means that if somebody submits a bully offer, which may be you, you may want to advise your clients to do that, then um, you know that's allowed. Oftentimes, though, you'll see that the sellers will not be looking at preemptive offers, right? Because they want the opportunity to, to take a look at what people are going to submit and you know, right now that we're expecting 10 or 20 offers on a property, it's in the seller's best interest probably to wait to see what those are. And if the listing agent does their job well, you know, they will pick the top two or three offers that are probably close and have them, you know, compete, right, and drive the price up. So, you know, it's, it's up to the seller if they're going to review preemptive offers or not. But in this particular case, if they are willing to entertain preemptive offers, then, you know, if your client does want to proceed with one, it does have to be a good offer. And it has to be an offer that, you know, uh, will basically, um, it, it, will, it will need to be firm, it will need to be um, a good so that basically um, they're, you know, they're willing to forego the competing offers. But the other thing you will want to do with a preemptive offer is to make the irrevocable really tight. If you say, here's my bully offer and you have until tomorrow to think about it, then that listing agent also has until tomorrow to notify everybody else who has seen the property that we have now moved the date and time to review offers up to tomorrow, right? Because that's when your offer expires. So preemptive offers not only do they need to be really great offers, but they need to be uh, really tight. So maybe you submit it and you give them four hours to get back to you, right? That sort of thing. Remember, it's a bully offer. <laughs> so uh, you don't want to give them all the time in the world to think about it. All right, let's see what comments I have coming in. Um, has to be firm, really good offer. Yes, okay, <laughs> perfect. All right, so suggesting the right price. Now we're working on tweaking this a little bit on the Zola website. I'm sure you guys know that when you pull up a property, if you scroll down, there's something called market value and it will tell you the approximate value of a four bedroom home in this area. So it will tell you if they have priced it low based on the comparables. So, you know, if it is priced for $9.99 and you scroll down and you see that the approximate value of this particular home in this particular area, is 1.13, then you know that they've listed it low. Um, but as I said, even right now, those comparables, if they're saying that this is what it should go for, 1.135, it will probably right now in the market that we're seeing, it'll probably go for more. So again, talking to your clients about that, um, but just know that we are tweaking this. Yeah, we, we are tweaking this section. I am seeing comments uh, that it's not always accurate. Um, it used to be, now we've uh, we've pulled in a section there where we're showing the comparables that we're relying on, and sometimes those are older listings. So like I said, we're, we're tweaking that right now. Um, does Zolo have auto notify all agents of how many offers registered? So if you have submitted an offer to uh, the listing brokerage, they should have a system in place where you're getting notified. Actually, even if you've just shown the property, you haven't even submitted an offer on that particular property, you're going to be notified when offers are registered on that property. So there will, there will be, um, you know, you'll be notified that there's one, that there's 10, that there's 15. So even if you're not uh, bidding on that particular property, it's a good thing 
to still look at because then you can inform your clients later on, you know, there were 30 offers on this particular property and it sold for this much money, right? So even if you weren't a part of the multiple offer situation, at least you know how many offers were submitted. And of course you can reach out to the listing agent probably the next day to find out what it sold for because they need to wait for the deposit check before they can disclose that information. So uh, definitely, you know, keeping an eye on how many offers on, on all of the properties that you show your clients and letting them know. So they kind of know what to expect, what the market is doing. All right. So let me just close that out. And yeah, let me know if you have other comments. Um, because yeah, suggesting the right price, of course, in addition to looking at the Zola website, I know right now it's not 100% accurate, but also, of course, in your manual comparables. And this is a, a great way also to see, you know, the history of the home. So what has happened before, because in some cases, they will price it low because they previously listed it for a much higher amount and it didn't sell for that. So with this particular case, they had it originally listed for 1.479. They dropped it by 10,000. It didn't get any offers probably. And then they dropped it dramatically to 999, now hoping for multiples, right? So you know right there that if your client offers 1.1, you know that the seller's expectation was somewhere in the 1.4 range. So again, just, you know, this gives you some insight into what the sellers are looking for and what they're hoping for. Uh, but right now, I, as I said before, um, properties that are listed, you know, they don't, uh, most of the time they're going to go into multiple offers. So without having to, you know, do the price reduction and price low. Let me see what comments I have coming in. The last price they want. Yeah, exactly. So this is, this gives you insight into the seller's expectations. All right. Um, and then of course, yes. Yeah, so you do want to be doing the comparables as well, just to see what other properties on the street have sold for. And actually what you might want to do right now is just take a look at your area generally, right? Just look up uh, homes that have sold this month, last month, and uh, what they were listed for and what they actually sold for. This is really great information for you to know. And you can see how properties been selling for $100,000 more, $200,000 more, like somebody mentioned here in the chat. So, you know, definitely taking a look at the activity that's happening. So even if it's a property you didn't show, it's a property you didn't even write an offer on, uh, you can give, you can, you can take a look at what's been happening simply by searching sold properties and you can see what they were listed for and what they sold for. It gives you really good insight into, you know, the difference and what you might be advising your client on, right? So again, you're not advising your client, yeah, let's offer $5,000 more or 10,000 more when you can see that the history in the last few months, you know, the properties that have been listed for this particular price point, let's say 749, have mostly sold in the eights, right? Uh, so you know that that's what it's going to take. All right, so let's uh, carry on here. So preparing the offer, of course, is going to come down to that purchase price. So I just mentioned the purchase price you can determine by looking at the Zolo app, the low website, being success, even if it's, you know, it's a benchmark, it's probably looking at your MLS uh, system, taking a look at recently sold parables, but also look at the area generally. What are, um, you know, other properties selling for when they've been priced in this price point? And how do those properties compare to the one you're looking at? Of course, you want to be giving the close date that the sellers prefer. Hopefully that's an easy thing to line up. And then terms and conditions, hopefully you're going in with a firm offer. So we already discussed confirming the financing um, and doing a pre-inspection walkthrough um, or um, going in with a one-day condition, but really ideally going in firm. All right, so talking to your clients about that. And as I said as well, really having a line of communication with the listing agent. You wanna call them at the very beginning. You need to let them know that you have an offer coming. Um, you know, your client is excited to be working with them. Let me know what it's gonna take. You want to build a working relationship with the listing agent, right? Ask questions, uh, keep the communication open knowing the market and most recent sales as well. So, you know, sometimes you can ask the listing agent, you know, are you expecting it to go uh, in the 800,000 range? Are you expecting it to go higher? Of course, listing agents aren't allowed to tell us price, but you know, they might say to you, sometimes they give you insight. I've had listing agents say, well, just so you know, they did reject an offer that was 900,000. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> you know, if they're listed at 749 and I was, you know, considering an offer in the $800,000 range, but now the listing agent has told me that they previously rejected an offer in the $900,000 range, then that's a good clue, right? <laughs> that they're expecting something in the 900. So talk to your clients, see if that's within their realm of possibilities. So do talk to the listing agent, see what insight you can gather. 
All right, let's see what comments I have on this. Uh, yeah, exactly. They do give you hints. So don't be a secret agent. Don't, uh, you know, just quietly prepare the offer, submit it when you're supposed to, uh, you know, you're following all the rules. Definitely important to reach out to the listing agent, see what information you can gather. And then if you have developed that relationship, you have their cell phone, you're talking to them, you're going back and forth. When you're actually uh, in the time frame when you've submitted the offer, you can, you can, Call again, find out, how are we doing? Are we the top offer? Don't be afraid to ask those questions. Again, some listing agents won't disclose anything um, well, while others will you know, give you hints and clues trying to really drive up your price, right? Um, so let me see, another uh, question here. Is it possible a listing agent can lie to you? Um, no, they shouldn't be lying to you. So you know, as realtors, we are supposed to act ethically. And no, we, when we do have a duty as well to disclose, disclose, disclose. So um, hopefully they're not lying. They shouldn't be lying, but is it possible? Yes. Um, but if they're a good listing agent, if they're a good agent, generally they shouldn't. Um, I have another comment. They told me owner got lowball offer and got offended. Um, not more than such and such. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tips like that for sure. Um, yeah, definitely. You don't want to be submitting lowball offers in this market. Um, all right. Let's see what else we've got here. Traditional offers versus multiple offers. Uh, I do want to get to the escalation clause. So yes, have a strategy in place, make sure it's the proper irrevocable time. So again, you know, not going in with a bully offer and giving them 24 hours to think about it. Make sure that if you are submitting a bully offer, you have a really quick irrevocable time uh, or you're following the rules. So if you are submitting an offer, you know, they've requested offers today at five, they're going to present at seven, then, you know, you're, you're following those. Uh, guidelines, and then maybe the irrevocable time is 11.59 p.m. tonight, right? Just to give enough time for signatures to go back and forth. Don't lowball. So yeah, uh, great timing on this point because somebody just mentioned here that uh, it may offend the sellers. So certainly not, you know, you're not wanting to lowball in this market. It likely won't happen. <laughs> and then the psychology of numbers. This is actually a really great point. So if you have a property that's listed for $9.99, um, it's probably, you know, if you've got a, if you have a number of offers come in, maybe you have a few that come in at 1.1, right? So if your client is, is thinking about the 1.1 offer, maybe offer 1.105, <laughs> you know, just to make it a little bit different. I always recommend odd numbers, right? Just because, you know, sometimes the way that it's listed will generate um, multiple offers that are a certain price point, right? So if it's listed for $4.99, you know, maybe they'll get a bunch of offers for $5.50. So why not offer $5.53, $700, you know? So just offering something a little bit odd. And I'm sure if you look at recently sold comparables, you'll see sometimes that the winning offers have, you know, a 777 or something creative that they've done. Maybe lucky numbers. I've had that happen as well, uh, where, where clients have submitted good offers and, you know, thrown in some lucky numbers in there. So yeah, definitely the psychology of numbers and then offering odd numbers, just you know, in case somebody else comes in with the exact same number as you. All right, so bidding wars. Okay, we're talking about that. Uh, I'm just gonna jump over that slide uh, because we want to be talking about multiple offers specifically and uh, uh, representing buyers. <laughs> yeah, in Vancouver, you see 888 numbers. That is so true. Uh, all right. Okay. So representing buyers in multiple offers. So if you have prepared an offer, um, I had a comment about this the other day on another webinar, uh, you can cross out the clauses. So your schedule A has the financing condition. It has the inspection condition. You can cross those out and have your client initial. If you do remove those conditions entirely, so they're not even in the offer, then make sure you're doing a form 127 because this is the buyer's acknowledgement that uh, you know they hereby acknowledge with respect to conditions that the buyer will not be including a condition in the buyer's offer for financing, uh, for selling their property, for you know obtaining a home inspection report. So just have them initial whatever it is that they're you know not including in the offer. Uh, this is you know mostly to to cover you guys so that if the buyer says later on, oh I didn't really realize, I didn't really understand it was a firm offer, I thought I would still have an opportunity to home to do a home inspection. Hopefully you don't have a client who would say that, uh, but this just covers you. So form 127, if you are removing those conditions from the offer. So it's the buyer acknowledgement. 
Um, confirmation of co-op and representation. I'm not going to talk about this, uh, but the escalation clause. All right, here it is. It's a bit of a controversial clause, but uh, I'll just read it to you guys. Basically, it states that during the irrevocable day and time that this offer, so your buyer's offer, remains open, if the seller receives an executed written form from another buyer, so we're going to call that the competing offer, if that competing offer is higher than this offer, the buyer hereby agrees to escalate his offer in increments of blank amount. It could be $1,000. I know that's not a lot when you're looking at, at properties. It could be 2000 3000 5000 until such time as the buyer's offer exceeds the competing offer. So the buyer's offer shall not escalate unless and until the seller has received a competing offer that exceeds the buyer's offer. Um, so that's the clause. <laughs> and then it says here as well, you may want to include the buyer's offer shall not escalate beyond a total purchase price of blank. So again, let's use that example of, you know, the property is listed for $4.99 and they put in the escalation clause. They say that they're going to offer $1,000 over and above any competing offer, um, but we don't want to go over $5.50. So what a listing agent can do here uh, is they can reject your escalation clause. So this is, this is the risk. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of different situ scenarios. Uh, the listing agent here might reject your escalation clause and then just counter you at 550, right? Because you've basically disclosed your buyer's top price. So what I would recommend if you are going to use this clause is not to add that second paragraph. So what happens there is if the listing agent uh, accepts the escalation clause, then what they'll do is they will counter you or they'll probably what will happen is it'll be a verbal conversation. They'll probably call you and say, uh, you know, given your escalation clause, there was another offer that was $8,000 more than you. Um, are you willing to go $9,000 more or $10,000 more, right? So that's part of the negotiation. So pros and cons of using this escalation clause, uh, it works for buyers. It's great for buyers. It gives them a competitive edge. Not every listing agent is going to accept it um, because for a number of reasons, they may decide that, you know what, $1,000 isn't really going to uh, make or break things. So you know what, why don't I just uh, reject the escalation clause and ask you to come back with your best and final? You know, maybe that best and final is much more than the ten thousand dollars right so um hopefully this explains this a little bit i don't want to confuse you guys on this it is a controversial clause to use uh, but we are allowed to use it Hi, sorry, I got disconnected there. Um, can you guys hear me? Can yes, you can. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I was talking to myself was, for a minute. <laughs> I was checking my internet. I thought I got disconnected. Yeah, no, it was me. I got kicked out. Uh, so let me just find you guys again. Are you still with me? All right, yes, screen share. You. Okay. Awesome. Okay, one second here. Okay, just reconnecting. Sorry, guys, I don't know what happened, but I'm back. And hopefully you can hear me. Awesome. Yes, 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 yes. Great. Okay. So, um, any questions about escalation clause? Okay, so I have um, so my my internet connection is unstable. Hold this with you guys here. Not sure what's going on, but um, you can find the escalation clause 
Uh, actually, I'll post it on workplace training channels. So this session gets recorded and I will add the escalation clause to the workplace group. Uh, I hope you guys are still with me here. Yeah, can I repeat? So the escalation clause, uh, hopefully you were, you were able to hear it, but basically you're offering $1,000 more or $2,000, $5,000 more, whatever it is over and above a competing offer. Great question coming in here. What if more escalation clauses is used by other buyers? Great question. So this is why if I was a listing agent, um, I would probably just explain to you, if you're representing a buyer, this works in their favor. It has worked for, for myself and others where listing agents have accepted it, but I've also had situations where the listing agent has said, you know what, uh, no, we're not going to use escalation clauses. We just want you to give us your best and final offer. Um, yeah, exactly. So if that's the case, then you can't use this, but try it because as I said, it has worked uh, for other realtors here at Zola. I know they've used it. In terms of where you can find this escalation clause, I will copy and paste it onto the workplace group um, and let you know. So yeah, great question here also, or comment about the listing agent saying to come in with your best offer. And then they say the owner might not give you a second round. That's the best time to do this. So if the listing agent says, come with your best and final, we're not gonna do second rounds unless maybe you know two offers are really, really close. Then this is the, the time to say, okay, here's our best offer and we're willing to go a thousand dollars over and above any competing offer right because now you know that they've said in their instructions that they're not going to go back so this gives you kind of an opportunity to improve your offer without having the opportunity of a second round so yeah perfect yeah so that's a really good example of when to use this escalation clause um what if more oh yeah okay so i already addressed that one um yeah, so not using this second part. So the buyer's offer shall not escalate beyond a total purchase price of blank. Because as I said, I think this is maybe where I got disconnected. But if uh, you disclose here that they can't go over and above 550,000 and their offer is 538, then you know the listing agent might take your offer and say, you know, we're not going to accept your escalation clause, but we'll accept your offer at 550. <laughs> right? So you're kind of giving them some inside information. Uh, so, of course, there is a risk that, you know, there is an offer that completely blows everybody out of the water. And here you have an escalation clause um, and your and the listing agent says, you know, we have an offer that's 905. Are you willing to go to 906? And your offer was initially 800. That's a huge difference. Right. So in that case, you may you may withdraw your offer. So really, the escalation clause really just opens a dialogue between you and the listing agent and hopefully gives you a little bit of insight in terms of how far off are you from the highest offer, right? And do you stand a chance? So again, I have used it, other agents have used it. It has worked for me, it has not worked for me, uh, but uh, it's worth a try, especially right now where there are multiple offers. But it does get tricky, you're right, when there are multiple buyers, uh, including the escalation clause, but uh, you know, hopefully that's not the situation. All right. Uh, so yeah, lastly here, it just says if buyer and seller agree on a total purchase price, they agree to execute the buyer's offer at such price, all other terms of the buyer's offer remaining the same. So again, uh, it's something to try. It's definitely something to give you a leg up when you're competing against other buyers. Okay, so here uh, I'm getting a few questions. Is, is escalation limited to $1,000 only? No, absolutely not. You can have your client offer maybe $2,500 over and above a competing offer, maybe even $5,000. Uh, but then, of course, you know, that's, that's a higher jump. So talk to your client about what they want to offer, how much more they want to offer. Um, and then the other question here, so the listing agent has to come back to you before accepting the escalation clause. So yeah, so this, again, opens up that uh, communication with the listing agent. If you do have an escalation clause and they do accept it, the listing agent will call you back and say, uh, okay, pursuant to your escalation clause, we have an offer that's $8,000 higher than yours. Uh, is your client willing to do the $1,000 more, right? Or $2,000 more, whatever it is that you've offered. So you go back to your client, you ask them, are you willing to go $10,000 over? And hopefully they are willing. Talk to them about an escalation clause being exactly what it is, $1,000 over and above a competing offer. So there is a risk that that competing offer will be $10,000 higher, maybe $25,000 higher, right? Of course, your client will have, have their own cap. And, you know, maybe it's not possible to, um, 
use the escalation clause, but at least, as I said, it gives you that line of communication with the listing agent. It's something you can go back to your buyer with, and hopefully you can get the deal done using this strategy. So again, try it if you haven't. It, it is something that has worked for, I know, quite a few agents here at Zolo who have tried it. And if it doesn't, then you try it on the next one. <laughs> All right. So that's the escalation clause. I'll provide that for you guys on the training channel in Workplace. All right. So presenting sellers in a multiple offer situation is different. So let's talk about that. Uh, let me just see some questions. Absolutely. You're welcome. All right. So these are very pretty slides. I apologize, but there's a bunch of information in here. So I'll just highlight a few things here. So multiple offers. Um, if you're a realtor trying to navigate a bidding war, uh, you definitely want to be reviewing the rules and expectations from RICO. And really the takeaway is going to be to disclose, 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 disclose. So let's talk about some basic rules, how you want to set up that bidding war, the offer registration process, how you're going to present these offers to your seller. Um, again, the, the option of just best and final or doing rounds with maybe the, the better offers. So communication, best practices, dealing with preemptive offers. Um, we won't talk about multiple representation, uh, but commission deductions. And that's maybe something that you see uh, if you're a buyer's agent, if you're getting emails from the listing agent with instructions on what to do for their offer presentation, uh, keep those on file for you because there will be a time when you're the listing agent and you have, uh, you have to set up a multiple offer presentation. Save those emails so that it's something that you can use as a guideline. And something that I see quite often in these emails from listing agents is that, you know, if you are going to offer a commission reduction to your client, that you do that uh, between you and your client. So the listing agent is saying, if you're going to reduce the commission to your buyer, do that directly with your buyer and don't change it on the confirmation of co-op. Because if you have, again, the takeaway here is going to be disclosure. If you're the listing agent and you have received an offer where somebody has reduced their commission, you need to disclose that. So um, it just gives you another thing to disclose. So that's why they're asking you, if you are going to do it, just do it directly with your client and don't change the confirmation of co-op. All right, so let's talk about basic rules. So you must disclose, so here are the things you must disclose, the number of offers you have received. So um, if you are accepting multiple offers, you always have that 801. So that's definitely something that you will keep to verify the number of offers you received. You definitely need to let people know if you or your brokerage is representing both the seller and a potential buyer. So you, if you're the listing agent with Zolo and you receive um, an offer to purchase from another Zolo realtor, then that is multiple representation. So you need to disclose that as well. If you yourself are representing a buyer, which I wouldn't recommend doing, especially in a multiple offer situation, just opens you up to the risk of a complaint, especially if your client wins the offer, you know, you might've disclosed some information there, or you might be accused of disclosing information. So if you're representing the seller and you're also representing a buyer in a multiple offer situation, of course, that's something that you need to disclose, but hopefully you're not in that situation uh, just because it is uh, a little bit sticky. So any changes to the offer process. So this is a great example. If your client didn't want to receive preemptive offers and now they do, then you must disclose that. If you receive a preemptive offer, this is now going to change your offer deadline. You can't just silently uh, look at the preemptive offer and then accept it and let everybody know, oh, it's sold. You must tell people, everybody who, have, who has registered to see the property, either they've shown it or they're about to show it, they need to know that you have received a preemptive offer and you're going to be looking at it tonight at seven. This gives other people an opportunity to also submit their offer. So uh, just know that that needs to be disclosed as well. What you can't disclose, of course, is price. So you can't disclose the substance of any offer. So you can't say, you know, the other offer is $559. Can you go better? Um, but there are hints, as I was talking about earlier, where the listing agent will say, you know, you're close. You know, can you improve your offer? And then you might say, do we need to improve it by 2000 5,000? Is that going to, is that going to get us there? Right? So you can have those conversations and, you know, see, see what they disclose. So they can't disclose price, but they might be able to provide you with um, hints, as we've said before. <laughs> 
All right, so set up a bidding war. So if your pricing strategy is to try to generate multiple offers, you'll generally set an offer date in the future. So let's say maybe you uh, post the, the listing on MLS on a Monday or Tuesday. So you allow for showings throughout the entire week, of course, during the weekend, and then maybe you accept offers on Monday. So um, that's usually how you will set it up. And uh, as I said, you know, in the past, you can, you know, that price point of $9.99 is often what um, determined, like it's priced low in other words, or yeah, it's priced low in order to generate multiple offers. But right now in the market that we're in, we're seeing uh, that properties aren't listed low. They're listed at fair market value and they're still going into multiple offers. So right now, if you have a listing, expect multiple offers. So set a time and a date for when it's convenient for you and your sellers to review offers. So make sure that it goes live on a Monday or Tuesday and you allow showings throughout the week over the weekend and you accept offers maybe the following Monday or Tuesday. So it should be sold within a week. All right, offer registration. So buyers need to know how many offers exist. So when they submit an offer to you, hopefully they're also calling uh, Zolo to register the offer, but if not, you need to update schedule lock. So if you've received an offer, um, you'll want to register it as well. So even just call the office and say, I've received an offer on this listing and they'll be able to register it for you. Uh, I believe you can also go into schedule lock to uh, add offers that you've received along with the uh, realtor's name and brokerage that they're with. So a couple of ways of doing that. So uh, doing that in schedule lock will then notify everybody who has shown the property before or is about to show the property that uh, there are now five offers on this property. So um, definitely, uh, make sure that everything is registered properly. Um, and you can't register it unless you've actually received it. So if you have a call from a buyer's agent saying, I'm going to send you an offer in half an hour, you don't register it until you've actually received it. <laughs> uh, brokerages keep copies of all written offers. Uh, that's true. The 801 document is, is intended for that so that um, the that's what's kept on file as opposed to the entire uh, offer. All right. Offer registration time. So many listing agents set an offer registration time. So for example, 5 or 6 p.m. and then an offer presentation time. So I'm sure you have all seen this in the brokerage remarks where they, they're asking you to submit offers at 5 because you're going to be presenting at 7. So hopefully people are respectful of that and they do um, submit their offers on time. All right. How many offers are there? So, oh, I think we just did this. Sorry, I don't know why I have a repeat in there. So behind the scenes. So let's just talk quickly about this um, as we almost run out of time here. But behind the scenes, you wanna keep an ongoing list of who is submitting offers, right? You wanna make sure that you're really organized. I, you know, I, I feel for those agents, the, uh, if the listing agents who received 71 offers, that must've been coming in fast and furious and they, uh, probably really needed a system in place. So make sure you have, again, just a simple Excel spreadsheet. You can create it beforehand um, where you have columns, right? So uh, have you received the 801? Yes or no? Uh, who, who's the, the name of the agent? So you might want to do buyer's name, agent's name, uh, offer price, deposit, irrevocable date and time. Hopefully that's the, the date and time that, that you've given them. Uh, are there any conditions? Is the check attached or the deposit being a bank draft and any other additional notes? So if you have col <laughs> columns like that, you can enter in each offer and it's really easy for you to take a look at it and go, okay, uh, let's sort this by price. <laughs> who has the best price? Who has uh, firm offers? Who has the check you know, attached? So definitely have something that keeps you organized so that you can, you know, again, just keep track with a, you know, a visual of what offers you're getting and what uh, they entail. All right. Um, I'm just getting a few questions. How can we see details of listings that are on MLS, but not on TREB? Great question. So if you're not a member, if you're only a member of TREB, then and you're putting an offer in on something that's listed on RAB or OMDRAB, reach out to the listing agent, ask them for the full broker view of the MLS listing. And they'll also probably send you the schedule B if, uh, if it's required. Well, it would be. So um, yeah, just reach out to the listing agent. Um, if offer time is five and presentation is seven, can offer be submitted after five and before seven? Uh, yeah, that often happens, but you know what? Again, you wanna play fair with the listing agent. You don't wanna have um, 
you know, you don't want to be annoying them <laughs> with, you know, uh, a late offer and then having them scramble to properly organize themselves for presentation at seven. But it often happens, I'm sure you've had it happen where you've submitted an offer and, you know, offer presentation is supposed to happen at seven. And then you get an email saying, you know, we've had to move back our presentation time to 730 because we're still waiting for offers. So again, it messes up the whole system. So if they've asked for offers at five, be respectful and submit the offer at five. It is my suggestion. All right. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Behind the scenes, you definitely want to stay organized so that you can present properly uh, to the seller. Um, and then before presentations begin, make sure that you, I mean, you've already met with your client to walk them through the process. They know what this is going to look like. Uh, you've already walked them through the standard you know, agreement of purchase and sale, so you don't have to explain all of the clauses at this time. Right now, all you're asking your sellers to focus on is the price, the deposit, what's included and excluded. So what are they asking for? Uh, what are these buyers asking for in the offer? What are the conditions, right? Maybe you set aside the, the offers that do have conditions and you look at firm offers first. Uh, is there a closing date you know, that isn't in line with what the sellers want? Maybe you set that one aside. So anything else that's out of the ordinary. So you want to make sure that you have read everything beforehand. That's why listing agents ask for offers at five if they're going to be presenting at seven, so that they're familiar with all of the, of the different offers. So be respectful of that. Make sure that uh, you, know, you are sending it on time so that you're not creating that last minute work for the listing agent. All right, again, you wanna be working with them. Uh, will you post these slides on Workplace? Yeah, for sure, I can do that. Not a problem. Um, email or in-person offers. I'm not gonna get into this because right now, you know, especially with COVID, we're not doing any in-person offers. Everything is done virtually. So uh, yeah, just make sure that everything is emailed. And uh, again, you're probably not printing these out even. <laughs> you're probably even having a virtual presentation with your sellers. You may uh, be physically in person with your sellers to present these offers, but I think even that right now might be done virtually. It's up to you and your client, uh, but definitely you don't want um, buyers presenting in person. Have them submit their, their offers electronically. Um, and then, yeah, you do have the, the option of giving these instructions before the offer presentation day and time, are you going to be uh, asking everybody to submit their best and final, or will you be giving people a second opportunity to improve? So again, what I've seen most listing agents say when they've sent out these emails is that they will not be doing a second round unless it's too close to call. So in other words, send in your best and final because only those two or three, those three best offers will be, you know, asked to maybe improve because they're, they're really close to another offer and it's too close, too close to call. So uh, definitely make sure that, you know, you're, you're instructing everybody to come in with best and final. You don't want to be giving everybody a second round, especially if you're looking at 71 offers, that would just be, that would just be crazy. All right. Um, okay, best practices. So no matter how you decide to run your bidding war, the most important thing to do is email everybody outlining the plan. So we've talked about this already, how offers will be submitted, uh, the ideal closing date, the deposit instructions, you know, adding them to deliver the deposit here with. Um, definitely you wanna be communicating with everybody, letting them know how many offers there are. So that's done through schedule lock. So, you know, that's, you have help there with that. And if you have special requests or disclosures that you need to make, you know, definitely sharing that. So if you did have a pre-listing inspection, hopefully that was something that uh, you shared with everybody beforehand. Um, and then yeah, seller's intentions. We will be looking at firm offers first. We'll be giving priority to offers with uh, the deposit attached. So again, just explaining how you're gonna be looking at this and which ones you're gonna prioritize. So those are the best practices. Um, within what time frame can offers be improved? Yeah, so great question again. So this is why, you know, uh, I would recommend a buyer putting in an irrevocable until 1159 because yes, it might be presented at 7 p.m. Um, but then, you know, if they have 30 offers to go through, then that's going to take them some time. And then if they do get back to three people and then they're improving, that's going to take probably another hour. So you do want to give enough time um, in order for, for people to improve their offer. So you should expect to hear from the listing agent within an hour of them presenting, again, depending on how many offers they received. And 
and uh, you'll probably hear from them faster than that. This is always a good indication. If you hear from the listing agent pretty quickly, that probably means you're one of the better offers. So um, that's a good sign if you get a call right away. Uh, but yeah, in terms of within what time frame offers can be improved, you should hear from the listing agent within at least the hour. And if not, reach out to the listing agent, find out where you're at, find out what you need to do in order to be considered. If you're not hearing back from the listing agent, you're probably not being considered. So call, find out why. All right. Um, all right, all right. So we have, if we list the property slightly higher than market value and after 10 days, no offer, when would be the good time to reduce price? Yeah, so great question. If you listed the property high um, and you haven't received an offer, then I mean, at that point, if you've been on the market longer than two weeks without an offer, definitely that's the time to reduce the price. You don't want it to be sitting there uh, for any longer than that. I would do a cancel relist uh, at around the two week time frame. Um, yeah, because as I said, so that's a great point though too, for, for those of you who are working with buyers who don't want to be in multiple offer situations, take a look at the properties that are, that are priced slightly higher, right? They may be considering a price reduction. Don't be afraid to go in and offer on those properties slightly lower than, uh, you know, what is being, what it's being listed for. So there's still opportunities out there if you have buyers who do not want to bid in a multiple offer situation. Um, all right. Okay, last but not least, disclosing the sold price. So as I said before, the takeaway is just disclose everything except the sold price until you actually have a firm offer and the deposit check in hand. The photo of the check is not enough. You actually have to go and pick it up if you're the listing agent or have the buyer deliver it uh, to, to the brokerage. So you need to make sure that that check is in hand, either in your hand or at the brokerage before you can disclose sold price to everybody who submitted an offer. Uh, okay, let me see, last but not least, uh, I keep saying that I feel like I have more slides here than I thought I did, but uh, I think I already went over this. So I'm just gonna leave it there with uh, the sold price. And let me get to your questions. So can we do a price uh, reduction, yeah, and not relist? You can, absolutely. Um, it's it's better to do, well, it's up to you. It's it's up to each listing agent, but it's, it's nice to do a cancel relist because then it comes up as a new listing. So that might be the strategy there to recommend. Um, if I am the listing agent, will Zolo auto notify other uh, 40 plus offers that the seller decided to refuse their offers? Uh, no. So this, this goes back to that Excel spreadsheet and making sure that you have a list of, you know, all of the agents who have submitted offers, definitely their email addresses, uh, you know, just take the time as you're receiving these offers to plug in that information, what their offer price is, what their conditions are, because yeah, you'll want to, you'll want to communicate with everybody, um, about what, what the seller has decided to do for sure. So I'm just, I'm second guessing myself. I'm not sure if you can log into schedule log and send out an email to everybody through there. Um, I have different access than you guys. I have an admin access, so I think I can, but I'm not sure if that's um, uh, just a, a general thing. So just to be safe, have an Excel spreadsheet, definitely keep track of all of the email addresses so that you can share what the seller has decided to do, because you do want to thank everybody for their efforts after the fact and, you know, let them know what the seller decided to do. So um, will you be sharing your uh, contact and for follow-up questions? Yeah, absolutely. So you can reach me. I'm going to give you both my email address and my direct number. Uh, there you go. So yeah, if you guys have other questions that you'd like to chat with me, uh, talk to me about, definitely let me know. But uh, yeah, I guess we're out of time. Uh, let me know if you have any other last minute questions. Otherwise, as I said, I'm here for you and your growth managers are here for you as well. Let me just check the chat. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, good luck out there. I know it's crazy, but it is it is doable. So hopefully there are a couple of tips and tricks there for you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Stay safe. Bye.